This text is Hunger of Memory by Richard Rodriguez. Today we are reading pages 9 through 17, which is pages 10 through 15 in our PDF. I remember to start with that day in Sacramento, a California now nearly 30 years past, when I first entered a classroom, able to understand some 50 straight English words. The third or four children I had been proceeded to a neighborhood Roman Catholic schools by an older brother and sister, but neither of them had revealed very much about their classroom experiences. Each afternoon, they returned as if they left in the morning, always together speaking in Spanish as they climbed the five steps of the porch and the mysterious book wrapped in shopping bags remained on the table next to the door, closed firmly behind them. An accident of geography sent me to a school where all my classmates were white, many the children of doctors and lawyers and business executives. All my classmates certainly must have been uneasy on that first day of school, as most children are uneasy to find themselves, apart from their families and their first intuition of their lives. But I was astonished. The nun said in a friendly but oddly and personal voice, Boys and girls, this is Richard Rodriguez. I heard it sounded out, Richard Rodriguez. It was my first time I had heard anyone name me in English. Richard, the nun repeated more slowly, writing my name down in her black leather book. Quickly, I turned to see my mother's face dissolved in a watery blur behind the pebble glass door. Many years later, there's something called bilingual education. A scheme proposed in the late 1960s by Hispanic American social activists later endorsed congressional vote. It is a program that seeks to permit non-English speaking children, many from lower class homes, to use their family languages as the language of school. Such in the goal it supports announced I hear them and am forced to say no. It is not possible for a child, any child ever to use his family language in school. Not to understand this is to misunderstand the public uses of schooling and is travelize the nature of inmate life. A family language, memory teaches me that I know of these matters. The boy reminds the adult I was a bilingual child, a certain kind of socially disadvantaged, the son of working class parents, both Mexican immigrants. In the early years of my boyhood, my parents copied every very well in America. My father had steady work, my mother managed at home. They were nobody's victim. Optimism and ambition led them to a house, our home many blocks from the Mexican south side of town. We lived among gringos and only a block from the biggest white, whitest house. It never occurred to my parents that they could have lived wherever they chose, nor was the Sacramento of fifties bent on teaching them a contrary lesson. My mother and father were more annoyed than intimidated by those two or three neighbors who tried initially to make us more unwelcome. Keep your brats away from my sidewalk, but despite all they achieved, perhaps because they had so much to achieve any deep feelings of ease, the confidence of belonging in public was withheld from them both. They regarded the people at work the faces and crowds as very distant from us. They were the other law goals. That term was changeable. In their speech with others, even more telling. Los Americanos. I grew up in a house where the only regular guests were my relations. For one day, enormous families of relatives will visit and there would be so many people that the noise in the bodies will spill out to the backyard and front porch. Then for weeks, no one came by. It was usually a salesman who rang the doorbell. Our house stood apart, gaudy yellow, 
and a row of white bungalows. We were the people with the noisy doll, the people who raised pigeons and chickens. We were the foreigners on the block. A few neighbors smiled and waved. We waved back, but no one in the family knew the names of the old couple who lived next door until I was seven years old. I did not know the names of the kids who lived across the street. In public, my father and mother spoke a hesitant, not always grammatical English, and they would have to strain their bodies tense to catch the sense of what was rapidly said by Los Gringos. At home, they spoke Spanish. The language of their Mexican past sounded in counterpoint. To the English of public society, the words would come quickly with ease. Conveyed through those sounds was the pleasing, soothing, counseling reminder of being at home. During those years when I first conscious of hearing my mother and father address me only in Spanish. In Spanish, I learned to reply by contact English, rarely heard in the house, was the language I came to associate with gringos. I learned my first words of English overhearing my parents speak to strangers. At five years of age, I knew just enough English for my mother to trust me on errands to the store one block away. No more. I was a listening child, careful to hear the very different sounds of Spanish and English. Wide-eyed with hearing, I listened to sounds more than words. First, there were English sounds. So many words were still unknown that when the butcher or the lady at the drugstore said something to me exotic, polysyllabic sounds would boom in the mindset of this sentence. Often the speech of people in public seemed to me very loud, booming with confidence. The man behind the counter would literally ask, what can I do for you? But by being so firm and so clear, the sound of his voice said he was a gringo. He belonged in public society. I would also hear then the high nasal notes of middle class American speech. The air stared with sound. Sometimes even now when I have been traveling aboard for several weeks, I will hear what I heard as a boy. In hotel lobbies or airports in Turkey or Brazil, some Americans will pass and suddenly I will hear it again. The high sound of American voices. For a few seconds, I will hear it with pleasure, for it is now the sound of my society, a reminder of home. But inevitably, already on the flight headed for home, the sound fades, the repetition, I will be unable to hear it anymore. When I was a boy, things were different. The accents of Los Gringos was never pleasing, nor was it hard to hear. Crowds at safety ways or at the bus stops would be noisy with sound and I would be forced to edge away from the chirping chatter above me. I was unable to hear my own sounds, but I knew very well that I spoke English poorly. My words could not stretch far enough to form complete thoughts and the words I did speak I didn't know well enough to make a distant sound. Listeners will usually lower their heads better to hear what I was trying to say, but it was only one thing for me to speak English with difficulty. It was more troubling for me to hear my parents speak in public. Their high whining vowels and guttural constant, their sentence that got stuck with it and ah sounds and confused syntax, the hesitant rhythm of sound so different from the way Gingo spoke. I noticed, moreover, that my parents' voice were softer when those of Gringos with me. I am tempted now to say that none of this mattered in adulthood. I am embarrassed by childhood fears, and in a way, it didn't matter very much that my parents could not speak English with ease. Their linguistic difficulties had no serious consequence. My mother and father made themselves understood at the county hospital clinics in that government office, and yet, in another way, it mattered very much. It was unsettling to hear my parents struggle with English. Hearing them, I grow nervous. My clutching and trust, their protection and power weakened. There were many times like this night at a brightly lit gasoline station, a barely white 
memory when I stood uneasily hearing my father. He was talking to a teenage attendant. I do not recall what they were saying, but I cannot forget the sounds my father made as he spoke. At one point, his words slid together to form one word. Sounds as confused as the threads of blue and green oil in the puddle next to my shoe. His voice rushed through what he had left to say, and towards the end reached versatile notes appealing to his listener. Understanding, I looked away to the lights of passing automobiles. I tried not to hear anymore. I heard only too well the calm, easy tones and the attendant's reply. Shortly after walking towards home with my father, I shivered when he put his hands on my shoulder. The very first chance that I got, I evaded his grasp and ran on ahead into the dark, skipping with faint boyish exuberance. But then there was Spanish, Espanol, my family language, Espanol, the language that seemed to me a private language. I hear strangers on the radio and in the Mexican Catholic Church across town speaking in Spanish, but I couldn't really believe that Spanish was a public language, like English. Spanish speakers rather seem related to me, for I sense that we shared through our language the experience of feeling a part of some lost gringos. I was thus as ghetto Spanish that I heard and I spoke. Like those who live as bound by a burial, I was reminded by Spanish from los otros los gringos in power, but more intensely than for most burial children, because I did not live in burial, Spanish seemed to me the language of home. Most days it was only at home that I'll hear it. It become the language of joyful return. A family member will say something to me and I will feel myself specially recognized. My parents will say something to me and I will feel embraced by the sound of their words. Those sounds that I am speaking with ease in Spanish. I am addressing you in words I never use with Los Gringos. I recognize you as someone special, close, like no one outside. You belong with us in the family, Ricardo. At the age of five, six, well past the time when most other children no longer easily notice the difference between sounds uttered at home and words spoken in public, I had a different experience. I lived in a world magically compounded of sounds. I remained a child longer than most. I lingered too long, posed at the edge of language, often frightened by the words of Los Gringos, delighted by the sounds of Spanish at home. I shared with my family a language that was startlingly different from that used in the great city around us. For me, there were none of the graduations between public and private society, so normal to a mature child, outside the house was public society, inside the house was private. Just opening or closing the screen door behind me was an important experience. I rarely leave home all alone or without reluctance. Walking down the sidewalk under the canopy of all trees, I rarely notice the suddenly silent neighborhood kids who stood rarely watching me. Nervously, I'd arrive at the grocery store to hear the sounds of Gringo foreign to me. Reminding me that in this world so big, I was a foreigner, but then I returned walking back towards our house, climbing the steps from the sidewalk, then the front door was open in summer. I'd hear voices beyond the screen door talking in Spanish. For a second or two, I'll stay lingered there listening, smiling. I'll hear my mother call out singing in Spanish words, Is that you, Richard? All the while, her sounds will assure me. You are home now. Come closer inside with us. See, I reply. Once more inside the house, I would resume, assume, my place in the family. The sounds would dim, grow harder to hear. Once more at home, I would grow less aware of that fact. It required, however, no more than the blurt of the doorbell to alert me to listen to sounds all over again. The house would turn instantly still while my mother went to the door. I'd hear her hard English sounds. I'd wait to hear her voice return to soft-sounding Spanish, which assured me, as surely as did the clicking tongue of the lock on the door, that the stranger was gone. Plainly, it is not healthy to hear such sounds so often. It is not healthy to distinguish public words from private sounds so easily. 
I remained cloistered by sounds, timid and shy in public, too dependent on voices at home. And yet, it needs to be emphasized, I was an extremely happy child at home. I remember many nights when my father would come back from work and I'd hear him call out to my mother in Spanish, sounding relieved. In Spanish, he'd sound light and free notes he never could manage in English. Some nights I'd jump up just hearing his voice. With mis hermanos, I would come running into the room where he was with my mother. Our laughing, so deep was the pleasure, became screaming. Like others who know the pain of public alienation, we transformed the knowledge of our public separateness and made it consoling, the reminder of intimacy. Excited, we joined our voices in a celebration of sounds. We are speaking now the way we never speak out in public. We are alone, together. Voices sounded, surrounded to tell me. Some nights, no one seemed willing to loosen the hold sounds had on us. At dinner, we invented new words. Our sounded Spanish, but made sense only to us. We pieced together new words by taking, say, an English verb and giving it Spanish endings. My mother's instructions at bedtime would be lacquered with mock urgent tones. Or a word like see would become, in several notes, able to convey added measures of feeling. Tongues explored the edges of words, especially the fat vowels. And we happily sounded that military drum roll, the twirling roar of the Spanish ar. Family language, my family sounds, the voices of my parents and sisters and brother. Their voices insisting, you belong here. We are family members, related, special to one another. Listen. Voices singing and sighing, rising, straining, then surging, teeming with pleasure that burst syllables into fragments of laughter. At times, it seemed there was a steady quiet only when, from another room, the rustling whispers of my parents faded and I moved closer to sleep.